Hello and welcome to Watching Brief for the week commencing the 14th of August 2023. Um, I know I'm doing Watching Brief because I am actually wearing our new Watching Brief merchandise, this uh, beautiful pin badge, which has been designed by Mr. Soup. Mr. Soup, unfortunately, uh, he hasn't so much got a frog in the throat this afternoon as a whole flotilla of frogs. And so once again, uh, I'm going to be flying solo with this week's Watching Brief, which is going to take the form of a magazine style sort of catch up on some major heritage stories that have been running in the last week, 10 days. And then the second half of the show will uh, be a an interview which uh, I, uh, I conducted with the archaeologist and um, metal detecting uh, and heritage crime campaign of Paul Barford. Uh, Paul, is, uh, as you may well know, is based in, in Warsaw in Poland, and he will be talking about the current uh, row that's going on in Poland over what rules, if any, are going to be in place for metal detectorists um, in Poland, and whether a, a pretty uh, extreme in some people's views, liberalisation of the um, of metal detecting rules, um, whether that might actually influence what goes on in other jurisdictions in Europe and even the, in the UK. So that's what we've got ahead. Uh, I'm going to start with a, well, most of us uh, are aware of the fire at the Crooked House pub in Himley in the West Midlands, and I'll be coming back to that later. But watching briefs, watching brief is for the whole world of heritage and archaeology and uh, we couldn't let this week's show um, continue without uh, mentioning a statement from the World Monuments Fund which has uh, been issued uh, in connection with the appalling devastation devastating wildfires on Maui in the um, Hawaiian Islands chain. Um, the uh, the news bulletins uh, have been full of really very affecting images of uh, the uh, refugees from the fires, uh, the attempts to um, and the attempts to search for people who are still missing. I, I mean, at the time we we're recording, just over a hundred people are known to have died, but around a thousand are still missing. So it is an appalling natural disaster. Um, there is also a heritage aspect, though, and the um, the World Monuments Fund uh, have issued the following statements, and I'll just read a short piece of it. Um, the World Monuments Fund is deeply saddened by news of the fires on the Hawaiian island of Maui. We extend our deepest sympathy to families who have lost loved ones and those who have been forced to flee their homes. The fires have devastated Lahaina, a port city that was once the capital of the Kingdom of Hawaii and whose old centre is a National Historic Landmark District. While the precise scale of the damage is not yet known, a number of historic buildings, including the Waiola Church, where several members of the Hawaiian royal family are buried, are confirmed to have been destroyed. The wildfires fanned by winds from a hurricane and exacerbated by drought conditions are only the latest in a series of extreme natural disasters fueled by climate change, events which disproportionately impact indigenous communities and their heritage. The World Monuments Fund will continue to monitor the situation as events develop and to learn more about our efforts responding to disasters that threaten heritage around the globe. And to support our work, please visit our website and we'll put the link to that below the line. Um, I'll leave that there, it, um, and um, obviously we'll uh, keep an eye on on the developments as the WMF and others try to uh, restore the community after such an appalling and devastating event. Now, the next story um, we wanted to talk about really is a uh, catch up. Uh, the if you watch the last watching brief, you'll see it was devoted really to the fire at the Crooked House pub at Himley in the West Midlands, South Staffordshire. Uh, something I've learned since uh, beginning to cover the story is that if I didn't know before, because of our family connections with uh, the, the what's called the Black Country, um, because of the uh, the soot and uh, ash that was uh, and coal that was generated during the Industrial Revolution. Um, it's that names and places are really important, and and the Crooked House was a set uh, uh, was one of the, the iconic structures in the Black Country that gave people a sense of place. Um, if new viewers starting here, it was a an 18th century farmhouse, uh, which later became a, a pub and subsided um, because of the. Uh, extensive 
mining activity in the area. It became a, a regional and then a national icon. It was covered frequently on the BBC and other media. Um, it, and as we joked last time, it was the kind of place where if you drank enough, the building appeared straight and the bottle would roll, you know, uh, would, uh, bottles would appear to roll up the bar rather than down and so on because of an optical illusion. Um, almost two weeks ago, it burnt down in a mysterious fire. Uh, which is now being investigated by the police as arson. Uh, since then, there has been a vociferous campaign online um, and locally in the local media to have the Crooked House rebuilt. Now, at the moment, we're at the stage where there is a live police investigation, which we can't really comment on, um, but it is being treated as arson. Um, it has also been revealed that a 360 tracked excavator that was seen demolishing the building uh, within 48 hours of the fire, apparently without planning permission, um, was hired by a company associated with a landfill site next door to the public, uh, to, the, to the Crooked House, um, and other people associated with that landfill site had actually purchased the, the Crooked House back in July from its former owner, Bruco Marstons. Uh, it emerged this morning that the person who directs the company which hired the excavator um, although there's no direct connection and we can't draw any conclusions as to this person's character or involvement but was imprisoned in the Republic of Ireland for 12 years um, well received a 12-year sentence for involvement in one of what was then Europe's biggest drug importation busts um, in the early noughties um, there have been other reports that people connected with the um, with with the companies around which the mystery has grown uh, have also been involved in previous mysterious fires at a landfill site, another pub that was gutted to prevent it being reused as a pub, possibly without planning permission, uh, at another uh, another village in the West Midlands. Um, this is a, a, a story to watch, not least because a, a local MP. Uh, Conservative MP Marco Longhi called a public meeting this week and has undertaken to, prom um, to, to speak to uh, the community secretary, Michael Gove, whose department has responsibility for planning law um, with regard to the potential for what is currently being called a, a crooked house law. Uh, the idea is that it would strengthen protection for buildings like the Crooked House, which, although it had historical significance and certainly gave it, uh, you know, as a, a sense of place and, a, and, a, and a, an asset of local community and heritage importance, wasn't actually formally listed. Um, and uh, it would basically toughen up the protections that are available for those kind of, uh, for, for, for those kind of sites and uh, particularly for, for pubs, which are seen as particularly vulnerable. And um, so that is the latest on the Crooked House. As I say, it's a story that's developing. We will see whether the uh, the momentum that's built up over the first two weeks can be sustained. It's always the problem in major heritage stories like this, where initial enthusiasm can run into the sands of so often perfectly correct delays and apparent in activity, for example, the police haven't issued a, a recent update on the investigation, but then that's fairly normal in a, in a live investigation that um, you don't want to issue information that could compromise what's coming down the line. So um, again, with, what, with the Crooked House, we're going to be watching this space. Um, the other major heritage story this week came out of nowhere on Wednesday when the British Museum obviously one of London's leading tourist attractions, one of the world's major archaeological and cultural collections, announced that a member of staff had been fired and that the police had been called in and were investigating the apparent disappearance of an unknown number of artefacts which appear to be um, elements of uh, jewellery, particularly intaglios and um, uh, personal jewellery like finger rings, which have allegedly been disappearing and appearing on sale on eBay primarily since at least 2016. Uh, obviously, 
this is hugely embarrassing for the museum. Uh, I don't need to um, remind you that it contains uh, certain um, artifacts and collections of artifacts which are alleged to have been stolen in the first place. So the number of people on social media who've been mentioning the word karma, for example, in terms of what's happened here, uh, or making jokes uh, about the, has anybody checked the path, and, uh, has anyone checked the path on Athens? Um, it's, um, it, it damages the museum's re reputation and it obviously also turns the museum into a laughing stock. Um, it would appear that at least initially the artifacts that disappeared have disappeared came from the collection but weren't fully catalogued now the museum british museum stores contain several million items some people some reports have said as much as five million items um not all of which appear to have been fully inventoried and photographed which meant it was possible for artifacts allegedly to be spirited away and 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 somehow disposed of uh it within a few hours of the announcement a statement again which we'll link to from the british museum um a um a former a now former senior curator from the department of greek and roman antiquities was named in connection with the alleged disappearances um, this person is being is being named in a number of media outlets, which we'll link to. I'm not going to name them here simply because we haven't done our own due diligence. And uh, it's certainly also being reported that this person's family are denying any wrongdoing. Um, and certainly at the moment, there hasn't, uh, so far as we're aware, there hasn't even been an arrest, let alone a um, uh, any, any charges. So we need to keep an open mind here. But there are significant issues in play about the uh, ability of the British Museum really to track its own artifacts, to see, to, to know what it actually has. Now, again, you have, I think you have to have a certain sympathy because this is an organization that has been built up over several hundred years now, certainly the collection has. And um, the um, one of the collections that is um, reported to have been uh, the, the victim of the alleged thefts was acquired over 200 years ago and consists of many items. So the level of cataloging and so on uh, is uh, under question, shall we say. At this point, I think it's worth quoting from the British Museum press release, uh, which talks about how they are responding to this particular event. Um, it's dated London, 16th of August, and it says the British Museum has launched an independent review of security after items from the collection were found to be missing, stolen or damaged. Now, you'll note missing, stolen or damaged covers a whole um, gamut of possibilities. Um, which, and it also suggests they don't have specific knowledge of what has actually gone on yet. Um, it then goes on to say a member of staff has been dismissed and the museum will now be taking legal action against the individual. The matter is also under investigation by the Economic Crime Command of the Metropolitan Police. And again, that's a serious piece of police intervention because the Economic Crime Command isn't just the local CID. It's a, um, a, a, a region-wide unit of officers that specialise in economic crimes. Um, they've also announced that uh, there'll be an independent review of security, uh, which will be led by Sir Nigel Boardman, who's a former trustee of the British Museum, and Lucy Dorsey, who's the Chief Constable of British Transport Police. Um, their remit, according to the statement, is to look into the matter and provide recommendations regarding future security arrangements at the museum. They will also kickstart and support a vigorous programme to recover the missing items. Um, uh, it then describes very loosely that the majority of the items in question were small pieces kept in a storeroom belonging to one of the museum's collections. They include gold jewellery and gems of semi-precious stones and glass, dating from the 15th century BC through to the 19th century AD. None had recently been on public display and they were kept primarily for academic and research purposes. So again, part of the collection that has disappeared into store, it's there for academics, but it's not in the public eye. So attention might be elsewhere. Who's gonna ask for them except for specialist academics? It gives a cover for them to uh, allegedly be spirited away. Um, 
there are um, quotes, again, I won't read them all now, but uh, George Osborne, the former Chancellor of the Exchequer, who's the chair of the British Museum, and Hartwig Fisher, the director of the British Museum, uh, have both issued statements about the alleged thefts and sales. It's been obviously being responded to at the most senior level in the museum because of its seriousness. Um, it's also worth saying, although there's no specific connection yet, um, but Hartwig Fisher announced only a few weeks ago that uh, he'd be standing down from his role as director of the British Museum next year. It's worth just saying that uh, the apparent means of disposal, the alleged means of disposal of these artefacts is quite strange. Uh, it has been reported, widely reported now, that um, it wasn't being fenced through dealers, which is one of the, or, or auction houses, which is one of the ways that, um, shall we say, um, artifacts of dubious provenance can be disposed of into the collector's market. Instead, and there is evidence published to back this up, the suggestion is that it, uh, it was primarily being sold through eBay and through eBay at much reduced prices compared to what they could fetch on in in the uh, in the collector's market. I get, as I say, we're talking about intaglios and rings and that kind of you know, personal jewellery. Uh, so that is something of a mystery. It's also being reported that um, around three years ago, 2020, a, a currently unnamed subject expert spotted material turning up on ebay suspected it was from the bm british museum and did some checking and suspected that the source might be this named curator of the british museum and actually warned the british museum this might be going on now as you can see if that is anything like correct and the british museum knew about this as much as three years ago why have they kept quiet up until now? What's been happening? Was anything happening? Were people hoping it would it was not true or would go away? Or was it just not actioned? We don't know. Um, the security review will certainly uh, be asking those sorts of questions. And looking at the um, the way the story is going, uh, being covered in the mainstream media at the moment, a lot of journalists are hoping to come up with answers rather sooner than the British Museum's review. A watching brief is a formal programme of observation and investigation to record and report on notable discoveries on an archaeological site. As part of our ongoing watching brief, Andy and I work hard to bring you the best, the worst and sometimes the more quirky happenings from the world of archaeology. We aim to provide a space where voices can be heard, opinions shared and sometimes truth spoken to power. If you believe in the work we do, please consider supporting us on Patreon for as little as a dollar per month. Thank you. So that is the series of questions that are currently facing the British Museum. And I think there's one other conclusion we can draw is that probably the least attractive job in heritage communications at the moment would be head of comms at the British Museum. That brings us on to the main item in this week's Watching Brief, which is an interview with archaeologist and heritage crime activist Paul Barford. Uh, the, um, many of you will be familiar with the Paul Barford blog spot and uh, Paul's often trenchant views about things like metal detecting the portable antiquities scheme, but also uh, about the, uh, the, the market and the marketing of heritage items, particularly through uh, through auction houses and auction websites, um, we the reason that we spoke to Paul was twofold. One is that at the beginning of this month, August, the amendment to the Treasure Act came into be uh, came into force in the UK, uh, in in England and Wales, um, which broadened the definition of treasure to uh, to, to non-precious metal artifacts that have significance. Uh, I won't go into the details, but we'll link to the, um, the, the actual definitions that are current, uh, the new definitions that are being employed uh, below the line. Uh, and, and it's fair to say that among some metal detectors, at least there have been concerns that this is an attempt to tighten up on their hobby and introduce more regulation by the back door. It was done by what's called a statutory instrument, which meant um, there was limited parliamentary scrutiny. 
Um, so we began our conversation in talking about that, but the main part of our conversation relates to metal detecting in Poland and the efforts of metal detectorists and supporters in government to liberalize the metal detecting regime in Poland so that uh, there is less regulation than currently exists. Um, and in fact, the discussion is about moving to an app-based uh, permission system where you simply register where you want to metal detect. Um, as, you, as, as you can imagine, there are lots of questions that go begging with that. Um, and um, the implications both for heritage in Poland and perhaps elsewhere if the new rules become law uh, are potentially quite significant. So this is the conversation we recorded. Paul, thank you for joining us from Warsaw. Uh, we want to really spend most of this interview talking about the situation that's developing regarding artifact hunting with metal detectors in Poland. But I can't let the moment uh, or the interview start really without a, a reference to the situation here in the UK, where the statutory instrument, which amends the Treasure Act 1996, has just come into force. Uh, that uh, that that piece of legal updating um, arguably makes you uh, metal detectors metal detectorists in the UK uh, somewhat more regulated than they used to be it would it, it broadens the definition of what is treasure to things that aren't you know glittery goldy silvery um, and it appears to be going in the opposite direction to that which we're about to discuss with regards to Poland. Do you have any immediate thoughts about the coming into effect of the new definition of treasure in the UK? Obviously, it's something you've written about for a long time. Yes, thank you very much for having me, by the way. Thank you. Um, Pleasure. Yes, I think that, in fact, there is a connection here because it's... The, the, what's happening in Poland at the moment is very much related to treating archaeology as about things rather than sites from which things are just a, a product. Um, and here again, we have this new, uh, fantastic new reg legislation from England, which is, again, about getting good things in, in cases. Um, it's great that the idea is that it's going to be based around the idea of significance. I think there are severe problems with defining what that significance is in both the long term and the short term. Um, I think it'd be very interesting to see how this law actually operates within the next few weeks and months. Um, yeah. I, and, I, and I'm sure it's something that we'll come back to. I mean, what, one thing that struck me uh, in terms of things and in terms of the commodifying of things, reading the um, government's memorandum, which accompanies the statutory instrument, one of the points it makes in its in, in discussing the consultation is that uh, it does have an impact on small businesses, but uh, the, the, the statutory instrument wasn't amended in that light to remove that effect because they couldn't achieve the objects of the uh, of, of the new definition of treasure if they did make that am that amendment. Now that was clearly aimed at the rally codes, the rally companies that right. organise commercial yes. um, artifact hunting, and uh, I think that's one of the um, one of the things that again that maybe we will want to come back to in in future weeks and months as the as the new definitions bed in and and, and get put into effect by the portable antiquities scheme and the treasure team at the British Museum. But um, mo moving on then to the situation in Poland, um, very very broadly. You, I, I, I think I'm right in saying uh, this takes place against the background of a right of centre populist government, somewhat similar to the one that we have in the UK. Uh, that when Britain was in the U, uh, in the European Union, it was aligned with the same group in the European Parliament, um, and the there is now a very contentious piece of legislation coming forward, as I understand it, which would as many archaeologists feel, really damage the attempt at heritage preservation, conservation, looking after the sites, not the things, as you were saying earlier. Yeah. Could you just broadly speaking, um, for 
for for people who are watching this who aren't familiar with the situation in 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 Poland, what is the current status quo, and what what is being proposed? Right. Well, the current legislation that exists uh, at present it dates from two thousand and three, which is a modification of previous laws, um, which actually restricted metal detecting to a, to a great degree. Um, metal detecting in Poland today is you re you require a permit you you say i want to go to this particular site here's the the landowner's permission um i want to i want to look at this area here we will be there from such and such a time to such and such a time and can, can we do it this is this is in in line with all of poland's conservation uh, um legislation if you want to do anything to a, a historical site historical monument you have to have a permit if you want to replace the windows or i don't know dig up uh, dig up um, some some area which is is uh, untouched then you have to have a permit and it's the same idea yes um this permit system in fact has been in 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 place since the legislation of 1928 i mean metal detectors are saying this is some kind of bolshevik law of course it's not um, it was instigated at the beginning of Polish independence. Um, and it's, it's the way that everything works. And the metal detectors now want to make an exception to this. The problem for them is that um, to apply for this, to apply for this permit, you have to fill in a bit of paperwork. Yes, you have to actually submit some documents. You have to get the landowner's permission and show on paper that you've got it. You have to show on a map where you want to start, where you want to finish your search. Um, and then the conservator will look at that. They will look at the documentation they have in their, um, in their archives and say, well, actually, sorry, this area here is a conservation zone or this area here, we suspect that there's something um, important. So we would like, and this is it, that th this then uh, allows the conservator to place conditions on the way the searching is done. For example, you must use a particular method or you, you can look here, but not here, because here we believe it's very sensitive. Um, or if you go here, maybe you should have an archaeologist with you, things like that. This allows the conservation services to control what's happening to the archaeological record, the archaeological resources of the region for which they're responsible. Also, it means... Can, can, I, you can, could, I, can I... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah so can I just um, interrupt for a second just to clarify one thing? And again, it's for viewers in the UK. I, I presume by um, conservators, you're talking about what... Uh, I might refer to uh, as a county archaeologist, the, the local okay, government yes. service. I'm sorry, the Provincial Conservator of Historical Monuments. The, yeah. the terminology in Poland is is rather complicated and a little bit different from um, the British system, which is, is also another another um, issue. Um, mm. So this then allows the searching to be related to, for example, regional research strategies, conservation programs, uh, and so on. So to my mind and to the minds of many of my colleagues, this is oh, OK. Yes, if you're going to have artifact hunters going out to do something, then there is some kind of monitoring what they're up to and so on. Um, the other the problem for, for artifact hunters, for metal detectors, is that in Poland, all historical artifacts belong to the state. Um, which means that they it's, it's much like it is in, for example, Denmark, I, I believe, that they can't go out and dig up a load of coins or, or, you know, metal objects and put them in their pockets and walk off with them. At the end of the search, they have to write a report for the conservator and submit uh, the objects which they found. The conservator may say, OK, the museum doesn't want this, this or this. You can have those. But it has to go through the conservator. Yes. Um, so that's how the system exists today. The problem is that we have an unknown number of metal detectorists in Poland. Um, perhaps we can come back to that in a second. Um, the majority of whom do not apply for permits. They go out and they search and they take stuff and they don't um, apply for permits. They don't submit the stuff uh, afterwards unless it's something really exciting which they might take to a museum because in Poland, of course, if objects belong to the state, you can't just put them on eBay because immediately the police will be knocking at your door. So if you find some treasure, then 
Okay, you take it to the museum, and then you will get a financial reward. You may get a financial reward, depending on certain circumstances, yes? Um, so the majority of artifact hunting today in Poland has been done illegally, um, without any kind of records made of who's going where, what they're taking, and so on. And this is something which has been going on for some time, because before the law uh, was changed in 2003, um, you could go out with a permit, but the conditions of getting a permit were much, much stricter than they are today. So there's been a, um, you know, this has become much more lenient. And so uh, artifact hunters got used to the idea of just going, not bothering to, to, to get any kind of permit. And of course, most much of Poland is covered by forest. So if you just park your car somewhere and go off into the forest, the chances of actually being caught are fairly slim. Yeah. So most artifact hunters just go out, they, they dress up in camouflage and off they go into the, into the forest with their spades and, and they just dig up stuff. Um, another issue is that a lot of them are primarily interested in, in Poland. Um, of course, people are very interested in history, but the history that really gets people excited, metal detectors particularly, is of the Second World War or the, or the conflict of the 20th century. So a lot of the sites they're looking at are trench systems, battlefields, uh, unfortunately, also uh, bodies in, in the forest and this kind of thing. And they're looking for things like buttons, badges, um, this kind of thing, spent bullet cases, and if they're lucky, some, some you know weapons or something like this. And they have quite large collections, which are totally illegal. Um, so that's the situation as it is today. Um, what they've what they've done, um, they've organised themselves. So from 2018, there's been the Polish uh, Explorers Association, it's called, that has uh, got 3,000 members, and they've been lobbying. They've been holding various conferences, meetings with politicians, and so on. At the beginning, with archaeologists. But when the archaeologists started pointing out, well, you know, what you're proposing is damaging the sites, they stopped talking to the archaeologists and, um, in fact, then started attacking the archaeological community. So this has been going on for some, some years as well. So they've been publishing on, for example, YouTube videos about the dark side of Polish archaeology and trying to pick out various um, faults in, in the way we and the conservation services are working uh, and it's got very acrimonious. Um, many of the ideas they've had about how to reform the legislation have been completely crazy. So unfortunately, archaeologists have tended to ignore this uh, to, uh, to some extent. Um, and then suddenly in June this year, it suddenly turns out that a proposed novelization of the existing legislation is going to go through P Polish parliament, through the lower house. And when we got hold of it, we discovered, um, to our horror, that it's, well, it's as one might imagine. There's no permits. Um, the idea is that you, um, you go along to a place you want to search. You then take out your phone and you announce that you want to search this site. Yeah. And the conservator is supposed to sit there and say, OK, right. OK, I know you're there. And the idea is that this so-called register of searchers will be used to announce that I'm going there. And then you will take, the idea is that you will take photos of what you find. Yeah, you find a, a, a spent bullet, you take a photo, you send it to this register. And then the idea is, they have the idea, and the politicians have the idea that the archeologist is gonna be sitting there saying, yeah, okay, that's a historical relic, that goes to the museum. Oh, that's okay, you can have that bottle cap or whatever, yes. Of course, most people search at weekend. So the question is, you know, um, who's going to actually do this? Because in most provinces, you have one archaeological officer who's responsible for everything. Um, and now the whole idea is that this person is going to be looking at hundreds of artifacts found at weekends um, by artifact hunters. Can I um, jump in yeah, there with a, a couple of yeah. quick questions? Then, I mean, obviously, uh, no, no, no. Well, thank you for uh, uh, elucidating so clearly uh, uh, what's obviously a, a complex situation, one that's been developing, as you say, since the nineteen twenties. Yeah. Um, but a couple of things strike me about the 
um, the proposals. Uh, one is a sort of practical one. It actually, in, in, in terms of reporting, ironically, uh, for someone sitting in the UK, there's actually uh, more responsibility on detectorists, artifact hunters, to report what they find than there is actually under the Portable Antiquities Scheme, unless it's treasure, which, of course, right. you have to report under, on a statutory basis. Yes. And that's the definition that is now changing to be you know, non-precious metals. Um, but the other thing, um, in, in terms of the legislation, is this a government-backed piece of legislation or is it what i call in the uk for example a, a private members bill that's been put forward by individual legislators um with the backing of you know elements of civil society it normally is um and, and that then uh, uh, and, and is the government actually is the government in poland actually backing this piece of uh, propo this proposal right yes the government is um for two 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 reasons well the shocking thing is that the metal detectors were claiming when they first produced this thing that they had done this in com in collaboration with the the head office of the conservation services in Poland, uh, including the, the the top guy, the general conservator of historical monuments. Yeah, it's the top guy. Um, we were very skeptical of this, but unfortunately, he went along to the first reading of this bill and said, "Yeah, we're all for this. This is great. We're going to legalize." these guys who are going out illegally. I do not follow the logic of that. Um, that was very disappointing. And uh, it's very difficult to understand why, except he belongs to the ruling party. And the ruling party was told that there are 100,000 metal detectorists in Poland. The detecting organizations are saying the number could be as big as 250,000, yeah? Um, and so they see this as potential voters. We've got elections coming up in a few weeks' time. And so they see this as uh, potential voters, uh, a group of people who have been discriminated against, who are going to suddenly vote for the ruling party if we do what they ask, you know, what they want, if we abolish this, this old-fashioned, stupid conservation legislation. Yeah. Um, so, yes, they, they, are, they are supporting it. Um, and it's really quite appalling to hear what some of the politicians are saying in the parliament, in the debates, because they've got absolutely no idea what it is that this is about. Yes, it is about protecting sites from being looted. And they see it as rescuing precious objects, which can then go into museums and be shown to people. Yeah. Um, it's not quite, as you put it, it's not quite um, that the obligations are greater because there's one little tiny flaw in the revised legislation. You OK, you are obliged to report you're going to search, but only if you're going to search for historical monuments or historical artifacts. Sorry. Um, if you say, oh, I was going to look for scrap metal in the forest yeah, or I lost my keys in the forest. Or um, this is a, a picnic place where people might have dropped uh, a lot of change. Then you don't have to you don't have to announce it, yeah. Um, and this is completely ridiculous. You cannot base a law on determining what was the intention of the person going out. If you go out with a metal detector, okay, you might be looking for historical artifacts or you might be looking for old keys. But then if it's suddenly taken to court, how is the court going to decide if a person is guilty? or not guilty of an offence, if it's based on determining what their intention was. Yeah, this is just completely bonkers. And and again, this is something which the politicians does, just haven't addressed. Another issue that I've um, I've read about in uh, preparing this, I think partly in, in your work, but also in uh, other accounts, and uh, particularly the petition that is uh, currently running, which we'll come to perhaps in a minute, um, is the potential of using this new legislation to launder artifacts from other jurisdictions and ukraine has been mentioned in particular do you, do you see that as a risk too yes um yes because the artifacts for example of the roman period they're the, they're the same both sides of the modern political bound border um so yes and of course as we know there is a lot of looting going on in ukraine but the other thing is that artifacts that were di discovered illegally before the, this law will come the, the law is supposed to come in on the 1st of may next year that's a fixed date yeah um but anything you've got at home which was found before that uh, you could now say 
oh, I'm going out here. Oh, look, I found this sword. Yes, you could you could just um, make up the discovery. You could even show a video. You can make a video which you can send on to this application showing you brushing the dirt off it in the ground. Yes. Um, and this is a, a, a serious danger because, um, and yes, it could apply to old things dug up in another part of Poland on another site, for example. Um, it could apply to material dug up in completely different countries. Um, I posted, I posted yesterday on my blog two swords. Um, okay, in, in this particular case, they were honest and said that they didn't come from Poland, but they could have done. And again, you know, all you have to do is to say, oh, I found this, I found this just now, you know, and, and be free to then claim your, your reward, yeah, your treasury reward. And this is another thing, sorry, that the treasury reward until now has been discretionary and now it will be made mandatory, yeah. In terms of, you've mentioned that there's a general election coming up in a, in a few weeks' time, and this is, I think, largely identified with the Law and Justice Party, which is the current governing party. Yes. Um, that, uh, to, to use uh, to give its name in, in English, um, do you see this as an issue that will be carried forward if they form the next government? Are opposition parties saying that they won't carry this forward, or is there now a consensus, political consensus, that unless it's stopped by uh, any form of protest or, or legal reviews, this is actually going to happen? This probably is actually going to happen because we have heard, I mean, there, there are a group of us who have organized to try and fight it rather belatedly, because, as I say, we really only found out about it um, officially in June. Yes. Um, so a few weeks ago. Uh, so we're trying to fight it. But we have heard that this is coming from the highest levels, that the government really want to pass this for those votes. Yeah. Um, sorry, I didn't say that if you actually look at the, the evidence for the number of metal detectorists, several people, including Sam Hardy, did some work um, not long ago, which doesn't seem to be known here. Um, the number is about 30,000, not 100,000, not 250,000, not any of these other figures. And if you look on their forums, you will see very clearly that all of these people, the majority of them belong to those right wing nationalist uh, parties. So they're already voters of the the, cover, the, the governing um, coalition. So it's not going to gain them, in, in fact, any votes. But it is going to totally ruin um, the, the actual system. Because as I say, it just takes away this one type of activity by a historical monument away from the rest and just breaks down the system. Yes, it, it's, it's quite ridiculous that everything is protected. You need a permit for everything, except if you want to go out with a metal detector and a spade and dig up stuff, um, which seems to me to be totally illogical. And it's, it's really disgusting that the government is just using this as a, you know, some kind of political um, ploy to, to get votes, yeah, to sell off the heritage, basically, to sell off access to the heritage to get votes. This is, this is just totally inexcusable. Now, um, you mentioned the, the work of, of yourself and, and your to try and um a question asked about this albeit uh, um as you in the last few few weeks there is a petition uh, by the uh, association of polish archaeologists which is currently on online and i believe yeah. it's also uh it, it can be signed by people outside of uh, yes. of, of poland yes. um apart from signing that petition and we'll link to it uh, below the line on on, on this video um, is there anything that concerned archaeologists outside of Poland can do to try and influence things at this stage, do you think? I think it's probably a little bit too late. I think that this juggernaut is just trundling along. Um, it's, so it's gone through the lower house who voted you, almost unanimously for it because there's a lot of peace politicians in the, the lower house. It went to the upper house, which rejected it. And that's gone back to the lower house, which will just ignore what the Senate said and, and probably will vote for it. And we have a president who signs anything that's put under his nose and he's told by the party to, to sign it. So it probably will be passed. Um, and it's there's probably not a lot that can be done. You know, it, it is possible that had international organizations like the EAA or UNESCO, ICOMOS, if, if they had actually raised a fuss, but then of course they didn't know about it. 
I think, uh, you know, another thing that really irritates me, as you, you know, my position about metal detecting and the portable antiquity scheme in Britain, it's the same here. Most archaeologists just shrugging their shoulders and saying, well, you know, it's going to be passed. What, you know, what, what point is, some of them didn't even want to bother signing the, the petition, which I thought was really pathetic. Um, you know, you, you wonder what's the point of being an archaeologist if you're not actually going to defend um, the material you work with, yes? Or, or, or the materials your your follow your um, successors will be having to work with. So I'm not entirely sure there's a lot that can be done. What I think, as somebody who, as you know, is fighting about metal detecting quite a long time now, I'm quite interested in one possibility. You know, there's a whole group of archaeologists. Um, let's not name any names, who say what, what would be really great would be to go away from these restrictive systems to a liberal system like Britain has. This is what the metal detectors are saying. There's a whole lot of archaeologists saying this. And yet, funnily enough, most nations have never actually done that. OK, Flanders is one example and Poland is going to be another. Um, and I'm, I'm actually looking forward to seeing what happens because... OK, if we're working with the idea that we've got 100,000 metal detectors in this country, then let's see how many people use that application. Yeah, um, I think it's going to be a total disaster. There's no reason why anybody who goes out illegally now uh, will stop being illegal when they can do it by phone. I think there's one thing which the organisers have not thought about. If you connect with this online uh, government based application with your phone, you're actually giving your phone data to, to that application. And it means that you can use that phone data, that we can use that phone data, or somebody can use that phone data to actually check if somebody was at a particular place at a particular time. This has already happened in Great Britain. Some Nighthawks have been uh, tracked by the fact that their phones were um, tracked to a particular field at a particular time or a particular area at a particular time, yes. Polish metal detectors don't seem to have thought about this at all. And I think this is quite interesting, um, particularly as Poland is quite well known for uh, um, some uh, episodes of uh, invigilation of the opposition, yes. So so maybe, maybe at some stage this may backfire on the metal detectors. There's also an, another situation. If a policeman raids your house, which they do here, um, and they find objects. They say, OK, this this fibula. Show me this fibula on your phone, on this application. The police immediately can check that any artifact in a metal detectorist's house has been registered or not. Yeah. Um, this is something which they don't seem to have um, don't seem to have twigged, particularly as in Poland at the moment, metal detectors are a target whenever there's any kind of Interpol or, or international um, operation like Pandora, for example, the Polish police go straight to the metal detectorists and then they can seize 4,000 artifacts, yeah? Um, so, so the metal detectorists are a target for precisely this, this kind of action. And this, this application will make it far, much, far easier for the police to actually check. They don't even have to take the stuff away to check if it's you know, registered or there's a permit or anything. So, uh, uh, as ever in much of heritage legislation and heritage practice, uh, unintended consequences, perhaps. Uh, I think that, that's probably a good point to uh, leave it, Paul. Um, the watching brief is certainly going to keep a watching brief on what happens next. It's uh, Obviously, we still hope that something that appears to be so damaging might not make its way through the, right. um, the legislative process. You're, yes. you're pessimistic about that. Um, I'm sure we'll be talking about this again, but um, Paul Barford, thank you again for joining us on Watching Brief and giving us such thank a fascinating much. insight into the situation with metal detecting, artifact hunting in Poland, which could well have a, an influence on what goes on elsewhere. Thank you very much for joining us. Bye. Bye-bye. Obviously, there's quite a lot to uh, sort of download and decompress uh, from that conversation with Paul Barford. Uh, we could probably spend watching brief for the next month looking at the implications both for Poland and for the rest of Europe metal detecting in general um, and you'll be relieved to hear we're not going to do that um, but please um, these are important questions so join the debate in the comments below the line uh, 
And um, I would also remind you that if you have a story like the Holy Story or the other stories we talked about earlier, that you think the pipeline and watching watching brief Archeo Soup should investigate, uh, my DMs are open on Twitter, uh, aka X, if we have to call it that. Um, but also we have a an email for the watching brief itself. And um, if you go to the pipeline website and look at the tip of the story page, there are lots of other ways of getting in touch, um, in, including getting in touch sort of discreetly if you have information that you can't publish on a public forum like the, the comments below. Um, so that's it then for watching brief for this week. I'll just remind you that we have our wonderful new watching brief merchandise. Uh, if you want one of these, and there are three other badges as well that um, are available. Uh, I won't spoil now. Just go to the Etsy store for Archeo Soup and you'll see these available either individually or as a set at a very reasonable cost. Um, and, uh, and I should also, of course, mention that we have our Watching Brief Patreon. But um, I wanted to give you a sneak preview of another um badge and initiative that we're going to be selling and it is this 